Good morning, everybody. Hello, hello. Good to see you all. Hello at home. Happy Sunday. I hope you're enjoying the snow. It's beautiful outside. Um, well, before we begin and start introducing our guests and, and hearing about the, the wonderful work that's, that's taking place, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, happy Sunday. Uh, we give you so much thanks and, and so much praise, and uh, we pray for your Holy Spirit to be here with us now, that, that it would attune our hearts and attune our minds and our ears to your work that's being done in the world all around us. Uh, we pray that you would keep us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, um, right, um, so, so welcome to the adult uh, Ed, Forum Hour. Uh, we're joined by uh, three special guests, truly. I'm going to introduce one who in turn will then introduce the other two. Um, I think that will work out well. Um, yeah, it, uh, our speakers today and, and uh, our speaker uh, on our last, uh, the outreach last uh, at the end of the month, um, they, they're all kind of topically connected. And, and I would like you all to keep in mind that um, this is in preparation for our Lenten uh, practice, our Lenten outreach. Uh, we are going to learn more, of course, today. But um, uh, keep your hearts and minds open to how we might be able to participate in the work. Um, so with no further ado, I would like to introduce the, the great uh, Leslie Roy, um, megastar. Um, OK, let's see. Will you talk in that so I know which mic that is? Yes, it's on. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us in person and those of you that are at home watching. Um, I'm really excited that we are, this past month, are focusing on all the great things that we do with our outreach committee. There's, I think so many people at St. David's really aren't aware of all the good works that we're doing out in the world. Um, I want to give a quick recap of what Project Insanga has been doing since it started in 2016 um, before I introduce our guest. So for those of you that aren't aware, um, I started Project Insanga to help our outreach partners in Uganda. Um, girls and women there do not have enough menstrual supplies and um, what it does is it keeps um, them out of school and out of work. So I had, um, we found Days for Girls, which is an organization that makes washable menstrual supplies. And everything they need to manage your menses is in this kit. Um, it has sewn and, and non-sewn components. Um, so the first year we started in 2016, we had a group and we made 500 kits that we took over to Uganda. What we quickly learned when we went there was that made a, like a drop in the bucket even at their schools. We couldn't supply enough kits for all the girls and women and the teachers. And then through their medical center, they wanted all the women that couldn't afford products to have them. Um, so what we ended up doing was we actually had Days for Girls train the tailors at the school in Uganda to make kits. And they are working now on becoming an enterprise. So when we can't come and bring kits to them, they're actually sewing kits. So we just raised money this past year to buy electric sewing machines um, that they needed to continue the work they're doing. And they're actually electric and manual, which is kind of cool to see how that works. When they don't have the electricity, they can still use them, but they'll be able to sew things so much faster and provide a better quality. We've also done the same thing with our um, partners in Guatemala. And actually now, um, with the work that our team has done. So we're actually the Wayne, we, here we call it Project Insanga, and Insanga is the um, Ugandan word which means issue. So when I asked, I said, what do you call when you have your periods? And so a common word is, is Insanga. So that's what we named it, but we're actually the Wayne, Pennsylvania Days for Girls team. So Days for Girls is an international organization that has patented these kits. Also, when they're given out, there's a whole education program that you know, covers menstrual health you know, menstrual health, male and female body parts, um, safe sex, trafficking, self-defense. So a lot of different topics are covered, um, which, you know, they don't, you know, get that education. Um, we have, since we started, uh, along with my team leader, Eileen Kraut, who's here today, and Teresa Marlino, 
Um, our team has distributed 3,700 kits, uh, 15 different countries, and then also uh, most recently in the U.S. So what happened when COVID started was all the international travel was canceled. People were suddenly home, had time to sew, but masks were needed. So we actually turned to making face masks. And I think we got up to like 30 different organizations that we gave them out to. So then people kept contacting, like here's a group that needs them, here's, you know, these people need help. And as we were giving masks out, and the I started asking too, like, do you need menstrual supplies? We have these washable kits because, you know, there just was, there was there were people that were losing jobs. They just, there was so much need. Um, and what that really led to was I got introduced to some great organizations in the area. And we've been getting to help um, with the guests that we have here today, who I would like to introduce because they are doing fabulous work here in the um, tri-state area. So today I have guests from No More Secrets. So Lynette Medley, the founder, and her daughter Naya McGlown, did I say it right? Um, are here to speak about the work they're doing just because it's, it's incredible, um, the need that's out there, right here in our own backyards, and, and that what they're doing to address it. So, without further ado. Much. I am so happy to be here today and just to really talk to you a little bit about No More Secrets and how we got started in this work. Um, First, I just wanted to say, you know, I'm just blessed and humbled that I was invited to be able to bring my voice and the voices of our community here today to have this conversation. So No More Secrets as a whole is actually a comprehensive sexuality awareness organization. What we focus on is decreasing taboos and stigmas around any topic that has to do with um, a sexual um, a sexual topic that you know impacts marginalized communities is really not talked about. So a lot of work that we when we first started was around the Me Too movement, around protecting safe spaces for people to uh, be able to you know respect their privacy, have healthy relationships, and also have a voice when they felt like they were being um, violated in some type of way. So we started having these classes that were called Cupcakes and Crucial Conversations. And Cupcakes and Crucial Conversations was really what it was. It was, we would serve cupcakes and we would have these crucial conversations with young people in our communities just around bodily autonomy, respect, healthy relationships, and just really try to protect them and keep them safe and, and teach them how to basically have autonomy and protection over their body. So we referred um, millions, you know, a whole lot of different people, adults, young people, and I remember one day uh, this young woman, this young girl was in my office and I was telling her how you know, um, she was referred to me because she was engaged in high-risk behaviors and just, you know, engaging in really unhealthy choices. And this young person looked at me and said, how do you expect me to respect my body when one week out the month, no one cares about me and my family? And I remember I almost fell out my chair because I'm a, you know, therapist and counselor. And I said, what do you mean? Because I didn't want to put words in her mouth, but I really wanted her to articulate what she was telling me. She said, well, one week out of the month, I have to sell my body, engage in sexual favors, steal, use anything that I can find to be able to, you know, have menstrual products for myself and my three younger siblings and my mom. And I remember I looked at her because in my mind, everything I had ever heard about this period poverty were, you know, like prisons and homeless and all of these, you know, conversations that just didn't seem to fit with this young person sitting in my office. So I asked her, I was like, you know, are you homeless? Are you independent care? She said, no, I live at home with my mother and she doesn't have the finances after she pays for the rent, the utilities, the food and things like that. So my sisters and I, we struggle and I really have to do these things to get assistance. And I remember looking at her and I said, you know, well, does Medicaid, you know, is she on public assistance? All of these questions, because I really wanted a full picture of what I was dealing with. I didn't want to just say, oh, and you know, really, you know, silence her voice. And she said, well, did you know that that doesn't cover it? And she said, no, my mom is home. We are on public assistance, you know, and, but it doesn't. And I remember saying to myself, you have got to be kidding. 
So do you mean Medicaid, Medicare, WIC, SNAP, nothing covers menstrual products? And so we went online, started looking for resources because people were telling her to go to this place, like the health department, Planned Parenthood, all these different places. So instead of, you know, how sometimes as, as, as counselors and social workers, we kind of say, these are the resources and go about your business and not really find out, we sat there on the computer all day looking for resources. I'm calling the government, calling different people, and people were very nice. The health department was like, Lynette, we can give them one or two, but we don't have monthly supplies. Like, we can't give family monthly supplies. Talk to Planned Parenthood, which is a, you know, organization that I work with for other things. They were like, no, that's not in our budget. We can give, so it was this really, this, this ongoing conversation about there are no resources for menstrual products. So I remember saying, well, I have to do something. You know, this makes no sense. So again, talking about the menstrual cycle is still a taboo and a stigma, let's be wrong. And I come from a conventional Baptist, you know, background. So I said, well, let me see what we can do about it. So we started saying, we're going to do a, a drive. And we started collecting um, products for our office at the time. And I was not going to tell people it was period. So initially, I even called it toiletries for teens. Like, I'm not going to these, you know, rigid black people or in communities and be like, listen, give me period products. Because remember, we really didn't have a language, you know, because this was, what, five years ago when we started, five, six years ago. So people were talking about periods like this. So I remember I started toiletries for teens in my office, in my tree, and we were just collecting products. People were donating. But we started getting a lot of toothbrushes and everything else because toiletries was there. And I remember we were actually you know collecting a lot of products and then again the community said to me Miss Lynette that's really nice that you have this bank so we really created the first feminine hygiene bank in that area um, people started calling we were like this is really nice that you have that bank there but we can't get to you like how do you expect me I'm a grandmother I have six grandkids um, I can barely eat how am I getting to you we don't have the finances so immediately we pivoted and we started um, doing deliveries. We started going into the communities and really giving people all of the products that they need. And let me keep saying that we are not finance or funded. <laughs> We've been doing this through donations, through you know people just feeding into our, um, our vision. So we started doing donations. And it's ironic when we first started doing donations, we would go out and one person would say, hey, I need menstrual products. So we would give like a little package for the one person. And then like a week or two would call, we would get another call and they would just be like, we need more products. And I'm like, didn't I just come to your house? Oh, well, my aunt lives here. My cousin lives here. And that's one of the things people need to understand about poverty. Because when we think about poverty or menstrual insecurities, the first thing we usually come think about is food insecurity, home, you know, housing insecurities, maybe clothing when we have all these different drives. But the same populations that can't afford those items, just think, 50% of that population can't afford, afford menstrual products. And the same maladaptive, high-risk behaviors people use to, to be able to meet the needs of food and everything else are the same high-risk maladaptive behaviors that they engage in to get menstrual products. And when you're in poverty, you cohabitate. I know recently we just saw the um, unfortunate news where in a fire happened in Philadelphia, and they were like, why were 20 people living in that home? That's a normalcy. When we go out to homes, it's usually about 11 to 15 people living in one home because they cohabitate to be able to share bills, share utilities, and everything else. So again, a mother we just served had 12 children. So if you have 12 children and then maybe a partner is there or a mother are there, that's easily 15 to 20 people. And that goes into my story. So when we go into a home, because this young person was saying, my aunt lives here, this one lives here, we started saying, okay, when people call, how many menstruating individuals are in the home? So when we're doing deliveries, we can do 15 to 20 deliveries in one house, 200 in one block. And we don't just give out a couple of products. We give out a five-month supply to every menstruating individual that we give to. So on a normal basis right now, we give out about 52,000 products a week. We give around 52,000 products a week. In the one year that we've been open at the spot, we've given out over 6 million products. And we've served over 250,000 individuals. And the reason I say that is because when you start hearing numbers, it really talks about impact. And I definitely want to talk about the different range of products. So of course we give out um, the disposable products, but we also have partnership with Days for Girls, Diva Cup, 
period.co for sustainable options. But we have to balance what we give our community because we deal with communities that don't necessarily have running water, don't necessarily have operable toilets, don't have electricity, don't have gas, all of these things. And the reason we ended up opening the first menstrual hub in the nation was because of what was going on in our community. When you think of the pandemic, most people were able to resort to their homes and everything they needed was in the comfort of their homes behind the doors. But when you're talking about marginalized populations, everything they need is external. So we shut down everything and they were left to their own devices and nothing they needed were in their home and in their community. So we never shut down. Like we had scarves wrapped around our mouths when we first started because we didn't have, because what happened is that the numbers increased. So we were before pandemic doing about 80, 85 deliveries. During the pandemic, the height of the pandemic, we were doing 300 deliveries a week, just my daughter and myself. Because everything had shut down and every resource from community centers to churches to even the Wawa or the McDonald's that people would count on to go and clean themselves. So we have groups of people who actually use these facilities to wash up and clean themselves before going about their day. We had people calling us saying they were actively bleeding and could not get in line for the food, for the food, could not go get a COVID test. The ambulance wouldn't pick them up to take them to the hospital because they were actively bleeding and their clothes were bleeding. Everything went virtual to a community that didn't have computers and Wi-Fi. So they couldn't even register for everything. And I think the catalyst to us was when we got a call from the police district and this police officer just happened to be following us on social media in our journey. And we were talking about the need for all of these different things in our communities and the numbers were increasing and we also ship nationwide. So we know we deliver in Philadelphia, tri-state area, and we also ship nationwide, wherever somebody from Louisiana to Texas to North Carolina, whoever, because no other organization in the world gives directly to the families a four to five month supply of products. People will give out these little bags and call them period packs and say they're ending period poverty, but they're actually not. They're addressing menstrual equity with the ideology that I'm giving it to you and you're going to get it when you get paid, when your mother gets a chance to get to the store, when someone gives them to you. And we already know that black and brown Refugee immigrant populations have the highest rates of PCOS, fibroids, endometriosis, so they already have irregular periods that are painful and heavy. So when you give them something that they can't use, they can resort into more maladaptive behaviors because then they think something's wrong with them because you gave them what they thought, what they needed, and it's not enough, so now they're saying there's something wrong with me. So I'm always telling people that oppression shouldn't alleviate choice, no matter what somebody's socioeconomic status is, no matter what somebody's cultural or religious background is, you need to ask them, what can I give you that's gonna meet your needs so that you can live in dignity for the next couple of months? So again, the police district called us and we're like, I follow you on social media, I do not want this young person to get arrested, I need to keep it under wraps, Okay, what's going on? It was about two o'clock in the morning. A young person was in the back of someone's house and they were almost just shot and killed because they were using their hose to clean up because they were actively bleeding and they didn't have running water in their home. So we went out there and we met this young person, a police person, and she was just like, I don't have running water. I mean, usually I can go to the corner, you know, the McDonald's, everything shut down. The neighbor is frantic, like, oh my God, I almost killed this young person. And at that time, me and Naya looked at herself, she said, we need to create a space. And I looked at her and I said, we have no money. And she said, mom, they need a space. So in October of, was it 2020, we did a GoFundMe to open up the spot period, the first menstrual hub in the nation. Um, and I prayed and I said, God, if this is your will, by, Jan if Jan by January, we raised $10,000. We will open it up. It was like January 3rd, we raised $10,100 and we opened up the first menstrual hub, actually it's in the world. Um, 
and it is a 2,500 square place space. It has computer room, free Wi-Fi, a Brianna Taylor safe space room with um, futons, television, toiletries, all the menstrual products in the world, two bathrooms where people can actually clean up. We have some people who come every morning <clears throat> who clean up to you know use the sink. We have underwear, we have therapy, we have counseling, education, and it's a safe space for our communities. But in addition to giving menstrual products, and I'm gonna hold this up, because these ladies do not know how they've saved the lives of our eight, nine, and 10 year old children. They hate pads, they hate periods, they hate everything. But when we started introducing these, so the way we introduce sustainable options is we give them what they used to, but we add this like, hey, but by the way, we're gonna give you this too. They were like, oh my gosh, it's so cute, it's stylish. These are seven, eight, and nine year olds who have periods, who are trying to, you know, deal with whatever, you know, these parents do have, you know, ways of, you know, washing and different things, but it's such the stigma and such that big old pad and feeling nasty. These are now the, the hippest, hottest thing that everybody wants because we introduced it in a way that it was, this is for you, this is cute, you know, these are the different ways because parents spend so much money when people first get their menses because it's irregular, it's spotting, it's not, you know, and you use a panty liner or a disposable over, it's about what, 10, you know, I think it's gonna come on. But now this is comfortable and it's theirs. Ownership of your own is so important in our communities because they don't have a lot, everything's shared, but this is theirs and they really like it. So I, I love this and we have a lot of adults who now want them too because like, I'm not gonna tell you, our advertising was a little different. It was like, hey, this is really cute, it's really fun and everybody wants them. So I appreciate it because our younger kids are now, as we're having our conversations, because we have first period parties at the spot, we have oh my God period talks, we have Mincy's myth busters, all these things around education, around your body, around the menstrual cycle, normalizing conversation. Because the more I normalize conversation with my community, then I'll know what a normal period is, and they will too. And then we can start talking about abnormal periods when something isn't going right. So also we've partnered with Drexel University. They have nurses on site every Monday. University of Penn is going to start half theirs. We have a partnership with PCOM. So we bring all the wellness that we can to the um, spot so that they can have a holistic approach to period care. So uh, I don't know if it's my time. So that's really what we do. Um, we end period poverty. So what is period poverty? Period poverty is the inability to access menstrual products due to you know, financial restraints and also access waste management services and operable toilets. Many people think this is an international issue. This is happening in our communities every single day. This is not something that's just you know, out of you know, people outside of the country. And I think it's even more um, impactful in our communities because of so much of the stigma. So even in some areas people talk about it, we do not talk about it. You know, in some states it's still taxed, it's still considered a luxury item. And I think one of the biggest um, injustices that I think happened during the pandemic was that people sat at the table and added it to flexible spending and did not add it to Medicaid and Medicare. I don't know how you could have sat at the table and made a decision to add it to flexible spending when 85% of black and brown bodies were losing their jobs. So these are some of the things. So I think period poverty is a socially constructed injustice that basically impacts our most marginalized populations. And these are the people who don't have these opportunities to talk about it. They're not, a, they're not they don't have a seat at the table and no one's really talking about how we can keep them in a vicious circle of poverty just because they don't have menstrual products. You know, people will have the EARN programs and, you know, go back to work where you'll give them an outfit and, you know, some underwear, but no one's thinking about menstrual products. So because there are these low paying jobs, we don't talk about bathroom access and that's the biggest thing. So do you know that they can't leave the floor? They can't leave and just go to the bathroom when they want to, they have to ask for permission. And if their boss says, no, you can't go, then they're bleeding through their clothes and then they're not gonna to go to work because now they don't have a washer and dryer, they only have this one suit, this two pair of underwear, and so again, they've lost a job. 
Young people go to school with their one uniform, maybe two pair of underwear, they go. People say, let them wear a dollar store pad. Okay, fine, but are you telling the administration about bathroom access and how important it is to these people who don't have access to products? No, so they bleed through their uniform, get embarrassed, and then they don't go back. So these are the conversations people do not have, and we're really trying to, um, to change the narrative. Again, we opened up the spot, which is safety programming for optimal transformation. Uh, the first menstrual health in the nation, actually the world, is a drop-in center where people can come all day, all night, get the products that they need, menstrual products, and also because it's a drop-in center, one of the biggest things that we're always in need of is toiletry items. So from toothbrushes to toothpaste to body wash to soap and all of those things, um, so they can fully get cleaned up underwear and, and go back out in dignity. And also we have that education piece. Uh, Thank you. So it's no more secret. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. I, 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 thank you so much for thank education you. and uh, I, the work that you're doing is, is so important. Um, yeah, enough for me. Let's open it up. Let me throw a mic back to you. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, talk. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the work you do. I, I've known about it through Leslie. I'm on the outreach commission with her, but I have a couple of questions. Um, you said you're a counselor, or, or um, do you do you work there with? Yes. So you've transferred your work to help everything you do now. Yeah, our whole work. office has transferred over to the spot. And. Um, and so you give you you counsel the the girls about yep. other things, just everything, yeah. self-esteem, period, period care, all of the classes. Right. Yep, which is wonderful. And then when you do your drop-offs, um, is there any time to extend um, help when you do a drop-off, or do you do they know that they could call? Well, house. yes. Well, whenever people fill out the form or if they go online, they know that they can either come to the spot or get a drop off. Um, so either way, they know both ways. Uh, most people like to come to the spot because you actually get more products because I'm really not paying attention to how much you take. Um, and so and then they get the full experience. They can find, you know, they have the education and everything else. Um, we give out literature and information when we go to the homes and we definitely invite them to come to the spot. And roughly how many people do you think come by the hub every week or month? Oh, just every week. So we get about almost 50 to 60 people a day. What? Yeah. How could you hit? That must have been tough. God. Huh? God. Oh, wonderful. I swear, when I tell you wonderful. this is nothing but, and, and I'm sure you guys, they know, this whole journey has been a, 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 a spiritual journey. This is my assignment. This is my divine assignment. And I can only say anytime, God. It's no way what we've manifested into being from where we started. They, we were on like the third floor of our office running up and down steps with 50 pound packages I up remember, and down. I remember all you that. Had to God. Carry them. God. To, yeah. I, I really, and, and I know I'm not being, it's nothing, it's not because it just multiplies and it comes and it shows up and it just shows and it comes and it shows and it comes and it's God. Yeah, it, it shows through you. You, you, you shine. Thank you so Thank much. You. Uh, thanks you for sharing your story. Thank you. Uh, we hear you. Yeah, oh, yeah, there you go. Check, check. Um, I really do believe that you've experienced first, uh, through your story, uh, you had an answer to prayer. Truly a miracle. It's uh, just amazing how God's timing works. Uh, and it's incredible that you're able to minister to these physical needs. Uh, in what ways are you able to also address the spiritual needs that are there? And what message do you bring? Do you, how do you share your experience with this miracle and the answer to prayer with those that uh, you come into contact with? It's funny that you say that. Everyone who comes in 
I have conversations with and I talk and it's weird because somebody was just asking, what is your experience at No More Secrets? And people are like, supernatural, magical. And I think what God has given me, I'm exuding it in every conversation, every hug, every embrace. And I think the biggest thing is creating a space that's non-judgmental and accepting of who you are, no matter how you identify, no matter how you present, and saying that this isn't your fault, that we're giving you what you need. Um, and I think that's how it is. And, and we have one-on-one -on -one sessions with people, we have group conversations, and we really just feed into them to let them know that they are a gift and they, they are here for a reason. And even though this is something that has impacted you, because it's not your fault, it's not your fault. This has impacted you and we're here to uplift you in every way that we can. So, and we have people from all religious backgrounds who walk in from Islamic to, I don't even know some of the religions who come in. And we accept everybody, you know, we have a group of a group of Islamic girls who come. No matter what the group is, we just show love and acceptance. And that's how we really embrace people. And I think one of the biggest thing I've, things I've learned, and you know, I grew up in the church also, is that most of these people have never experienced safety. Safety is something we take for granted. And only through safety can you be vulnerable. Because if you're always on guard, I'm not going to be vulnerable and show my true self. So what the spot, through God's grace and mercy, has been able to have is a space where when people come in, they're transformed from the time they walk in the door, you can tell. All the hardness and all the, you know, disappointment and all the anger. Literally, when they walk in, they're like, because one thing I was intentional about, and I'll share, I was in period poverty, even though back there it wasn't, a, it wasn't a name, right? And I grew up with two parents who worked, and then I got married, and my husband, Naya's father, my son's father, ended up getting incarcerated. He's actually still serving life without parole. So I went from middle class to poverty overnight. Overnight. So I've experienced every system there was to understand how, I want to say, institutional, stoic, sometimes mean and nasty some of these systems are. So when I, you know, went to school, you know, got my math, you know, undergrad, master's, all that and stuff, I said, when I give back to my community in any way, now let me preface by thought, I thought my claim to fame was my cupcakes and cru crucial conversations. Never thought I was going to be the pad lady, but God saw different. But when we started creating this space, I remember people were like, well, just put this in there and put this. I said, this place is going to feel like home. When they come in, they're going to say, oh my gosh, this is welcoming. They want us here and they want to help us. So we were very intentional about creating a space that was not stoic and institutionalized and made them from the time they walk in felt like they were on the streets of Philadelphia or Maryland or Camden or Baltimore, but felt like we were there to try to help them. So I think all of that, again, was through God. You know, to tell me this is what needed to happen and people have been transformed. Even on our, what, Power A Period campaign, poweraperiod.org, is that it? If you look on there, there are stories of people who are talking about their journey through period poverty and how our organization has impacted their lives. Real life people who live here in Philadelphia. Did I answer your question? Okay. Oh, okay. So during the height of the pandemic, and I think Channel 17, she followed us and she kind of highlighted, during the height of the pandemic, we were tired, we were done. Me and Naya cried and cried and cried and we were just like, we can't do this anymore. We don't have any energy because it takes a lot. It takes a lot of our energy and our willpower and everything else and, and we were exhausted. And my husband, when we were getting ready one day, I said, I can't do it. I said, I can't, I can't, I have nothing else to give. I'm drained emotionally, physically. He said, well, you wish you were going to Disney? And I said, yes. Yes, that's my happy place. He said, well, why don't you act like you're getting dressed for Disney every day, like, you know, today. It was that one day. Act like you're going to Disney. Act like you're going to your favorite place in the world because this would be more of a mental transformation. And that day we did it. And can I tell you, even the community we were serving when we went to deliver, it was almost like, wow, they're here. They're giving us gifts. So it's almost like we're giving them gifts of dignity versus a handout. 
So they're like, so now everybody, there's the Mickey girl. So that's what it is. Every day we dress, because it's still emotionally challenging. It, it, it's draining, but it has changed the atmosphere. It's changed us. So I'm like, Nye, what ears are you wearing today? What shirt are you wearing today? Oh my gosh, what are we going to wear? So that's why we started wearing them, um, just to give this, this excitement. So even when we're on a block, everybody's like, oh my gosh, hi, there they go. So I just think it just gives them a, um, a level of excitement and fantasy. So that's why we did it. Yes. I've got a few things to ask. Is this on? Uh, firstly, you know, what sort of things do you need and, and how do you go about um, filling that need on a, a systemic way so it's sustainable? And then also, you know, you talked about um, uh, menstrual products being added to flexible spending accounts, which of course marginalised people wouldn't probably even have heard about flexible spending accounts. So what other ways can, what other things can we do to change that so it's not just on services that they don't have access to? Definitely. I think writing to our legislation, I've had many backdoor conversations with politicians and they're like, I'm just not bringing that to the floor. I'm just not, you know, as a woman, I'm already looked at some way and they don't want to bring up conversations around periods. Uh, they, they, they are not comfortable and they don't want to be the one. So right into your legislation um, bodies. Uh, and I think right now there's a bill out there, I think it's Mang's bill, and it's been sitting, it hasn't moved. But the bill is very heavy. I think it's a lot in it and that's why it's not moved. All I want is for it to be added to Medicaid. Like really, like I, I, I don't, I, I'm not going to say I don't care about the prisons and stuff. I'm trying to keep my population from going to prison. I'm trying to keep my population from becoming homeless. So it seems like it's a focus on those populations more than just a normal everyday person sitting at home trying to deal with it. So legislation is a big thing. Um, sustainability, write letters to brands. You know, you might not do a drive, but if you write to Procter & Gamble, you buy Kotex, and I don't, because I really don't think as many people know about us as they should, and I'm just be honest, it's because we're two black women who did it. I'm just, being honest, you know, we live in a world as it is. If we were not black, I think this would have made national news. Everybody would be talking about it, but this is just a sign of the times. And again, it doesn't bother me, but it just it bothers me that my communities and the communities we serve don't get what they want. So even writing, you know, some people can be at home and we've wrote to many of people, you know, we write, but writing to brands, writing to manufacturers, asking them, hey, have you heard that the first menstrual hub in the nation is here? Can you support them in some type of way? Um, and that would make a difference, yes. Definitely. Every opportunity, when I say I'm just a vessel to be used in whatever way, because um, I can go and talk, you know, I can talk, I can tell people what we're doing, increasing and making awareness. People don't know this is happening. People aren't aware that this is impacting so many people. And I think the biggest thing that we learned was that when the pandemic hit, people who used to volunteer with us were now asking for products because they were working at fitness clubs and gyms and restaurants. So there's nothing to bridge the gap for menstrual products. There's nothing out there. Can I yes. also say, I mean, we do wonderful work. So in our um, leaflet today, our bulletin today, we list money we've given and to all really good works because we have a grant program. But I don't think as a church we do things like try to influence legislation. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's something that St. David's should be doing. Mm -hmm. Or bringing it on your radar. I mean, I mean independent of whether, you know, what side you are, this is just human dignity. Human dignity. And it doesn't matter it doesn't. whether, what it doesn't matter whether you're left or right. And maybe the St. David's needs to be doing And I don't doing think more. people are aware. Because yes. when I've talked to people, they're like, it's not. It should be covered as a medical device. Like at the end of the day, so, and I think many conversations have pushed it to this reproductive. I don't address, I'm not a reproductive health, reproductive organization. We are a menstrual health and wellness organization. Seven, eight, nine, 10 year old, that, these are babies who just got their periods and they just don't have no, or women, like, that's what, it's a normal, they, you have no choice. You don't have a choice in getting it. Can I also ask, and I think my, my granddaughter is, um, her father's African American, I think my daughter mentioned one time that African American girls get their periods younger 
than than uh, well what, I would say or? that no. we have seen young people as young as seven and I always say seven so when you think about food deserts and healthy foods they're not in these areas right so they're eating a lot of processed foods processed foods are filled with what hormones Right now, they're giving these animals and these things all types of hormones. So if you give them hormones, these hormones are going into the bodies of these young people, which is kicking on their menstrual cycles very early. So yeah, seven years, seven and eight is normal for the people who we service. For getting them, that's why we think about this. Um, what we can, yeah, the menstrual cycles, yes. So imagine a mom, just a normal mom working and she has four daughters. Just imagine, and people don't think about it. Imagine buying menstrual products, because you know we sink, yourself and four girls. She can't eat. She can't pay rent. You know how much menstrual products are on a normal basis. So of course, when we can't offer sustainable options, we do. But some people, we can't, because when we see certain homes, yeah, we just can't. Because they can't clean them. And they can't wash them in the public um, laundry facility. It's a health code violation. That's why they don't give out the reusable diapers anymore because you can't wash them in the laundry mats anymore. Really. So yeah, any way that you think of, creatively, collectively, churches, whatever, because if you come to the spot, you guys have to come see the spot. Um, yeah, lives are being changed. It's on our website, on our social medias, every day. Families and lives are being changed. Where is the spot? It's in Philadelphia at 4811 Germantown Avenue, like at Wayne Junction area. Mm -hmm. So if you want to come one day, come one day out. Truly. Well, if there's no more questions, yes, please, Leslie. <laughs> what, our van? So we will be implementing the first, the van. She wanted to know the status of our van. We've been trying to get a cargo van um, to be able to do like a mobile unit. Cause right now we just driving our car. Um, so we did raise $20,000 towards our mobile menstrual health unit. And we are in the process of buying our van. So hopefully it will, we're waiting for, yeah, the chip shortage, we ordered it, or whatever. So hopefully by March, it'll be, and it's a mobile menstrual health unit where we'll actually have um, information around uterine care, wellness, safety, you know, all that stuff. And we wanna do pop-ups at churches, community centers, different things where people can come on, get some products, have a conversation, um, and get literature. So yeah, that's where we are. Thank you. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you for having Absolutely. me. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I just want to say on, on behalf of the church, I, you know, the work you do is so important, and, and partnerships really matter, uh, you know, the, the work that you've done together. Um, and, you know, from a church perspective, that we want to support the work that you're doing. And, and so this is our Lenten uh, outreach is, is, is really going to be focused on, on this work, and, and, and I think that it's important for us all to participate, folks uh, at home. Come on, camera. Um, yeah, because... Uh, yeah, this is really important. Thank, thank you. I'm you. learning. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Leslie. Any last words? Uh, truly. No pressure. Oh, yes, please. Can I ask one more question of you? For, with regard to Project Nsonga, what types of things could people get involved with if they're not involved with it from St. David's now? So... Uh, with Project and Sangha, we do. It's not just sewing, there's a lot of sewing involved in putting these kids together, but there's plenty of other tasks that do not require people to know how to sew. Uh, there's no age limit, so we've done, I think the youngest has been five years old that's helped, and up to whenever. We've brought people back that hadn't sewed in a while, like it's like riding a bike and get back on a machine. Um, 
So there's plenty of opportunities to physically come and help. I try to set up sewing things here at church four times a month. I have an evening, a Saturday, and then we usually do Wednesday um, during the day. And um, But there's also, we collect inside each of these kits, there's two pair of underwear, washcloth. So we collect things like that, Joanne gift cards. So we definitely have people that, you know, make donations or just cash because, you know, we're collecting. We send that. We just send a thousand dollars to Guatemala so they can buy more supplies to um, keep sewing days for girls' kits there. And the same thing, Uganda. We bought the sewing machines. We sent two thousand dollars for that. So we have that kind of work going on. So there's all those different ways. And then there's just there's information. Oh, and I have people that drive that like will drop things off. When we were, especially in the height of like doing masks and um, and getting days for girls' kits out to different places. The other place we are working is through our. Um, Reverend Jesse Alejandro, who's with Church of the Crucifixion. We are actually once a month going down there and we're teaching the women to, well, not just women, anybody that comes to sew. So they are actually making, they're just doing the drawstring bags now, but they've like, you know, and there, it's a couple of them are like, they're really good. They like never used a machine before and they've got on, they're doing beautiful work. So, you know, we're hoping that's a skill set that they're learning and maybe can take it because it's a lot of, um, there's a big um, immigrant population that that church is serving down in Philly, so we have that, so we're trying to reach out, um, but what I'm also trying to bring more awareness to these groups that are helping in the Philadelphia area, so we have No More Secrets, and the speaker coming in two weeks, same thing, is, is doing some work around this whole period poverty issue, because it is a, it's a big problem here. Um, lucky for us right now, and you got in Guatemala, our partners there are doing the work to support them because we can't get there all the time. So at least they're getting these kids out to the girls and women in their community. Um, but there's, I mean, we've already done, since COVID started, we've given out 1,400 Days for Girls kids. But there's a couple other teams in the area that have given out a lot more too. So um, we haven't really said, we haven't sent anything overseas. Everything we've been doing has been staying here and helping um, people in, this, in our own community. So does that answer the question enough? So, but anyway, but thank you so much. And, and I just, the other thing I want to say with the, you know, everybody that comes out, Project and Song, I've had in the, since we've started, uh, probably like s over 600 people that have been involved, some more than others. Um, we've used to go out, we were going out to some businesses, but with COVID, we haven't done that at all. But I have like three local schools where we go out and do um, monthly things, or they come here and sell and get service hours. So we've got some great connections that way. I'm going to hook them, start hooking them up with. No more secrets, too, because, um, you know, just getting the word out to support here. Hey, here's how you can help locally. And through the Days for Girls, I'm always talking about what we're doing here and how we're getting kids in the community. And all the other teams in the U.S. are like, you know, they want to do that, too. But they don't have, like, an organization like No More Secrets. So it's not as easy to find a group to, to get the word out. Um, but I'm going to send them a link to this today so they could hear all about you. And then hopefully I want to take it. Get you to brand no more secrets to every city, but I think we need to we need to like duplicate Lynette and Aya to do that. But um, it'd be a great thing because it really needs to have it. And I'm thinking if the women legislators don't want to speak up about peer poverty, then I think we need to write letters to the men. <laughs> so, but thank you guys so much for um, attending. Yeah. Alrighty, well, uh, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.